This is AI Inside, episode 32, recorded Wednesday, August 28th, 2024. Amazon saves 4,500 developer years with AI. This episode of AI Inside is made possible by our wonderful patrons at patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. If you like what you hear, head on over and support us directly, and thank you for making independent podcasting possible. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, welcome to another episode of AI Inside, the show where we take a look at the AI that is layered like a wonderful lasagna through all sorts of technology that we use on a regular basis or might use in the future when we've got household humanoid robots wandering about. Uh, that's a, that's just a little bit of a glimpse into what we might be talking about today. I'm Jason Howell, one of the hosts, joined as always by my co-host, Jeff Jarvis. How you doing, Jeff? Hey, boss. Good to see you. Hey. Good to see you too. Welcome for another episode. We've got a definitely a great great show with uh, some excellent news to talk about. Before we get started, huge thank you to those of you who support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. Like this week's featured patron, my sister, Kim Blazer. Kim, hey. thank you for supporting me from day one, me and Jeff. Thank you, sis. It's awesome. Thank you, Kimmy. So good to have you on board. Anyone can get on board. You don't have to be my sister in order to support us. Uh, Patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. Also, if you are watching us live, because week after week, we continue to get more and more live uh, viewers of this show when we're recording it, please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. That can easily be done at AIinside.show. All the information you need is there waiting for you. All right, so let's get right into it. Starting with strawberries. And what I'm talking about is the information who reported on its sources saying that OpenAI is targeting a fall release for its rumored strawberry AI. This at one time was called Q Star, and they ended up uh, reportedly changing the name of this. This is the model that is reported to be capable of solving complex math and programming problems um, much better than what we've seen out of current models. Also, though, part of the report is that OpenAI is working on another model um, or AI um, model called Orion, which would actually utilize Strawberry's high-quality training data to surpass GPT-4's abilities. Uh, so essentially, you know, Strawberry creating that high quality data that's then fed into Orion as its data set, its learning of model essentially, which is interesting. I'm, I'm super curious about this idea because on its surface, you know, we've talked about it before, but on, on this, on its surface, the idea of taking AI generated output and using that as a data set for an AI system just sounds, it sounds wrong, but, I don't know. Some people, you know, have pointed out that it's it's not actually. It it might seem like it would be wrong, but it just seems like it would be diluted information. But I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Two things. I think the first is that is the strawberry is supposedly capable of reasoning. And what I what yes. I love about all these topics Important. is it forces us to define reasoning. Yeah. What is that? Right. What is reasoning? What does it mean to say that it can reason something? If you give it a a, a problem, the the issue for AI remains that it has no touch to reality. It has no experience. It has no way to experience things. So can it come up with <clears throat> um, its own human-like algorithms of figuring out the world, reasoning things through, knowing what the impact of something is? Mm -hmm. uh, how does it test hypotheses against reality? So that's that's one. The second is this, is this uh, synthetic data thing. Yes. Uh, I remain still cautious as can be about that. Uh, I've mentioned oftentimes that my friend Mike, uh, Matthew Kirschenbaum wrote a piece in The Atlantic about the text apocalypse, about feeding upon your own entrails until you end up with a gray goo. Sorry for that. <laughs> right. Um, and the New York Times, I think it was, had a story this week uh, about uh, the illustration they gave is they gave it a bunch of handwritten numbers and then had it learn from the output of that over and over and over again until everything just starts to look the same. Mm -hmm. Um and I don't understand the logic of artificial uh, of of uh, artificial data, um, synthetic data. 
Yeah, uh, I have a hard time with that too. In, in the sense that uh, if, if you were saying this machine is trying to just train the machine better, that might make more sense to me. And it's, it's doing some routine to do that. But once again, it has no tie to human reality. Mm-hmm. And so it's making up something on making up something. And I just, I'm dubious it's going to work very well. I know there are experts who say I'm full of crap. Uh, and I don't know enough about the science and the, and the com- computing to, to get to the bottom of it. But I'm dubious. So we'll see whether Strawberry, in fact, wows us. I'm sure it'll have some great parlor tricks. And, uh, and maybe it'll be very useful in new ways. But I will say again, it ain't artificial intelligence. It's not general intelligence. It's not AGI. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No matter what, I'm not going to believe it. Yeah, well, that that is a good question. Like, I'm not sure that I'm I've seen AGI called out in relation to this, but we know that you know, folks like Sam Altman and and you know who are creating models like this, they really want you to believe that 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 is the, it's the past. Here, that's that they're, 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 they're all to get it's just there, around the corner. So. When I was yeah. a little kid, my parents would say the Christmas was around the corner, and I really wanted to walk around the corner to figure out that that's where Christmas is. Right? <laughs> it's it, to me, AGI is just like that. It's perpetually around the corner. Yeah. It's uh, perpetually just out of arm's reach, just over close. there on Third Street. Yeah, it's it's flying cars. Right, right, <laughs> flying cars. We're gonna have it in ten years. I guarantee it. And then that it's always ten years later uh, when it's gonna actually happen. That this and fusion. Oh. Yes, yes, that right, that too. Um, in the case of Strawberry, uh, it is a fall release possible, according to the report, um, done as part of ChatGPT, but a smaller version of the model uh, could actually still get pushed to 2025, so it could be pushed even further. All, all that's to say that like there is no obvious you know, kind of launch date for any of this. Uh, we could see it sooner rather than later or later or never. I guess. Right. What was interesting too about the story is that is that uh, OpenAI showed it to the feds. Mm-hmm. So it's, That's it's, right. They, That's they are in a constant effort. They're doing a very smart job of doing PR, otherwise known as lobbying, with the mm-hmm. government. Of saying, oh, we're the ones you should listen to. We are the smart ones. Yes, we want regulation, but we should help write that regulation. And we're going to show you this amazing tool we've done before we show anybody else. And they're playing to governmental ego, which is kind of fascinating. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, um, yeah. So very, very mm-hmm. interesting. And that, that by the way, what you're talking about, showing it to the national security officials, uh, aligns with um, their. They had announced a collaboration earlier this month with the U.S. AI Safety Institute. So this is kind of, kind of part of that as well. Kind of like proof in the pudding, sort of thing. Right. Um, I knew I, I knew the second I saw this had the headline of this article that we had to talk about it. <laughs> the Verge article by Sarah Zhang about the Pixel 9 Magic Editor. Of course, last week on the show, I showed off the Pixel 9 and some of the features. And of course, one of those uh, AI features is the Magic Editor, which is kind of a part of Google Photos. So the Photos experience, you can go in there and find a photo in your photo reel and go to edit it, and then you hit the magic editor button, which is, of course, denoted by, like, you know, graphical stars and <laughs> colors it, and it's everything. It's magic. It's an animation. <laughs> yes, it's totally magic. It's enticing you to go there. And then when you do that, you can take a portion of your photo, that you know, your real photo, and reimagine it. You can say, put daffodils here. Or in the case of Sarah's article, you know, remove the person from the Tiananmen Square photo or and i don't know if that was just used as like an example of what could have happened that that might not have actually been used uh with reimagine but sarah did show you know some images like here's a photo of a stream and then through the use of the reimagine tool able to edit in a very easily and i think that's a big part of her her point here um at the click of a button edit in a crashed helicopter that looks you know reasonably convincing or a woman you know sitting on a a carpet um in her apartment let's say and then edited with magic editor able to include you know a syringe filled with a red liquid a bottle of wine something that resembles like a lines of cocaine or some sort of powdery drug on the on the carpet and i think her her point is that is that these kinds of tools 
are the bar is lowered so far that as she puts it in the headline, no one's ready for this, that the assumption that photos equal reality has been challenged before, but this is the biggest challenge that we've seen yet because the masses now have access to this, this capability with very little uh, effort needed in order to do it. And I, I think I know where your where your mind is at on this, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, and, and I get the argument. It's the argument made in the, in the, in the next story you put up too, which is also yes. from um, uh, The Verge. <clears throat> that yes. the difference which here is kind of a follow up. Yeah, right, it's a scale like, and speed. Yeah. And so they they, they stole a, Mike, a famous Mike Masnick headline about Section 230 and adjusted it here. Hello, you're here because you said AI image editing was just like Photoshop. So it's going to go in and say how you're wrong. That's a bad faith argument because uh, it can do so much more and so much faster, which is the argument about so much about the internet. Mm-hmm. Okay, stipulated it can do more and faster. <clears throat> but let's remember that photography is less than two centuries old. Mm-hmm. And even in old-fashioned darkroom photography, uh, I've mentioned it before, there's the famous incident of uh, a photographer thinking that Abraham Lincoln didn't look uh, – distinguished and presidential enough. So he put one of, one of the famous portraits of Lincoln is his head on Calhoun's body, Calhoun being a slave owner, ir- irony of ironies, uh, yeah. and a horrible human being. And this came up at the, last year's Association of Internet Researchers conference I went to. We were talking about all of this and deep fakes and everything else. And one of the researchers said, I quote this in my next book, The Web We Weave, um, we forgot that we already figured out that we can't know truth. And in any of this, it's just simply true that we have to judge the medium, judge the source, uh, judge the veracity based on motive of what pe- people are giving us. And there are tools, some better, some faster than others, but there are plenty of tools that let you create anything you want. That's fiction, that's film, yep. that's yep. anything. So I put up on the rundown, I don't know if you can get to it because it's oh, time yeah, it. machine, uh, a story from um, 1990 which have the exact same fears, of course, about Photoshop. And saying in there that, <laughs> oh my God, look at the things that could be done with photos. And I remember yeah. being at the New York Daily News uh, in about 1991, where uh, I wowed them, showing them what could be done with photo manipulation. And they hadn't seen this before. They hadn't really seen Photoshop and, 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 and stuff. And I, I showed them what was happening with it. And um, there's always this little stage of shock you go through um, I didn't think we could do that. Oh, my Lord, what's the implications? Well, the implication is always that you've got to judge for yourself. And yes, there's now a factor, a new factor you've got to judge, but I'm not terribly concerned. Now, the other thing about, about AI image is right now you can tell it in a flash because it looks mm. so fakey. But it's made up from, from not just what's manipulated through the iPhone, but if you look mm. at the stuff that AI makes up on its own, you can tell immediately it has that strange sheen about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This came up last night on, on, uh, on Android faithful. We were talking about this and, um, you know, the, the, uh, example of the Taylor Swift thing that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, you know, the AI generated image of Taylor Swift supporting Donald Trump mm-hmm. and like, see, this is, this is what can, what happens when more people have access to these tools. And I was like, yeah, but what happened when that, when that was shared immediately people called BS like, right. Right. It, it's it's not like suddenly everybody was won over because this thing thing existed. It was immediately called out and widely spread that this thing was fake. And yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, but you know, my my feeling when I when I read through that is like, you know, Sarah, I'm, I'm a fan of of the work that you do and everything, but it just it feels very reactive. Like, oh, wait a minute, the technology is now too good, and we've we've you know. We've got to do something um, to, I, and I don't know that she's necessarily calling for slowing down development or just raising awareness, you know, potentially about this stuff. But I mean, the the tr- the challenge, the trick is the same as it ever was. It's as we've talked about many times. It's the people, not the tools. Just because the tool is suddenly better than it was before, doesn't ne- immediately make it a bad tool. Like it's right. people 
can and have done this for centuries. <laughs> in, in, oh, I'll do it again. I'll plug the book again. In the web we weave coming out this October, yeah. web 20 is the discount code for 20% off if you find it there on we go. basic books. Okay. Um, I, I go through a story which I won't, I won't dwell on right now, but I call it's called FAMA. It's, it's the ability, the system that people used before they had print, which was social. Mm -hmm. You, you knew the innkeeper, talked to the people who came through town, and the innkeeper cared about her reputation, and you tended to trust the innkeeper. But that salesperson over there, you know that he's full of crap and makes stuff up. That is to say that it's in the, it's in the ear of the beholder that it's our responsibility in the end to decide. And no, I don't think this leads to all kinds of new classes in media literacy and tech literacy and all that. It just means that we've got to understand the human motivations of why someone might make up something like that and make mm -hmm. us suspicious enough to ask. And especially anything you see that is too good to be true, stop. Just mm -hmm. stop and ask what could be behind this. It could be a great joke. It could be a great insult. It could be a conspiracy. You don't know, and you need to look into it more. But what you're looking into is not the technology. You're looking into how people manipulated it in whatever tool for their purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hey. I'm not scared. I'm not scared. Yeah, it it doesn't concern me either, but certainly a lot of people reacted to that. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of people do feel <laughs> that way about it. And I think it really at the end of the day, it comes down to the uncertainty tied to a new technology that is still kind of misunderstood, I suppose, or 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 kind of uh, making itself understood slowly. <laughs> yeah. And actually, you know, this is a topic that I'm sure we're going to, you know, have plenty of opportunity to talk with Sarah about when uh, she connects here in a little bit. Um, is it Gannett or Gannett? I never Gannett. know how to say Gannett. Gannett. Okay. Sounds fancy. Uh, Gannett. That <laughs> yes. Gannett shuttering its reviewed product review website. Uh, it, this is going to happen on November 1st, 2024, according to sources at The Verge. The content on the review site had been scrutinized for the authenticity of its content. Um, and this all stemmed from an October 2023 investigation by its own unionized staff who was questioning the writing styles and the reviews, could not verify the authors, you know, went looking on LinkedIn and other places online and could not verify that they actually existed, basically accusing the site of, of using AI to generate reviews content, which Gannett then um, attributed to a third party marketing company, Advon Commerce, uh, who later denied using AI to write the articles, but people internally there said, oh yeah, AI has been used to write some of their content anyway. So yeah. it's shutting down. What do you think about this? Again, that was using AI for sports stories too. Not really generative AI, but but a different structure. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is uh, bad in a couple ways, right? One is that they use this stuff. And two is when the employees uh, were whistleblowing on it, they ended up losing their jobs. Mm -hmm. And so kind of everybody lost there. Uh, yeah. They shouldn't have used it in the first place. If you're going to have a review site, I expect human reviewers to have put their opinions on the line to say, I used this product service, oh, 100%. watch this, whatever, right? Yeah. But if the truth is, I talked to the, I, I, there's an executive at another one of these awful companies I talked to some time ago who said, you don't understand, Jeff, we're in a war about reviews. And so the, he justified using AI to make up reviews which is to say that reviews online now pretty much have no credibility whatsoever. But it's not just reviews. It's a microcosm of what's happening to the web. People say Google is getting worse. Maybe it is in some ways, but I think the real problem is the web is getting worse. The web is getting ruined by this onslaught of junk. And it's not just synthetic data ruining AI. Synthetic data is ruining the web. And so, uh, yeah, Gannett, I think, ruined its credibility in reviews and probably had to get rid of this. The mm -hmm. fact that the employees uh, were the ones who blew the whistle and they lost their jobs is, is, is the wrong responsibility here. They should have gotten new jobs, goddammit. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, a lot of the crap that we're seeing on the internet now is AI generated and it's ruining it for all of us. Yeah. I mean, reviews is, is just one of many different types of content mm -hmm. that can mm -hmm. suffer at the face of, of, of this sort of thing. But but it is a very like it, it is a type of content that I'm personally very familiar with because I review products and yeah. as my own kind of ethical, you know, approach on this. 
I won't write something unless I truly feel it, you know, it, it deserves to be written or spoken about a product based on my particular use. And if I'm looking for reviews, content from someone else, I want to know that that's derived from some sort of personal experience, some, you know, so, something real and tangible and not an AI that, that just goes out and scours and finds, you know, the general sentiment about a certain thing and then turns that into the, the, the declarative uh, right, statement. Right. You know, right. and especially if you also have a um, affiliate link to buy. Oh, you yeah, know those totally. companies that are trying to make this stuff up are going to make up reasons to get people to buy this stuff, and yeah. so credibility goes goes nowhere as a result. Mm. Yeah, I, I used to be a reviewer myself of TV, and I mm. vowed that I would never use the fast forward button. I'd watch every damn minute of some of these horse horrible long miniseries. You don't know how I suffered, <laughs> but yeah, a reviewer has a responsibility to the audience. To say I'm spending my time so you can spend yours better, right? Oh, yes, I watched this this entire series so you don't have to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> AD it was the worst thing I had to watch a 14 hour miniseries. I watched every damn minute of it. AD, it was I terrible. vaguely remember that one. Oh, vaguely remember hearing about that. I don't know that I actually watched it. You were probably too young. Yeah, but I do remember. I do remember it. Like I, I do remember it existing. So uh, that and like Thornbirds. Did oh, you yes. have to review? Oh yes. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. yeah, that was a big deal at the time too. I think my parents <laughs> were way into that one. Anyways, uh, <laughs> scientists from China and the United States have developed a uh, pretty groundbreaking AI model called ActFound which can predict drug bioactivity. It could make drug development faster, more cost-effective. The model was actually trained on a pretty extensive data set, including over 35,000 uh, assays, 1.6 million experimentally measured bioactivities, um, a, a, a widely used chemical database, or sorry, T uh, training data was sourced from widely used chemical databases. So many databases, I guess the one big challenge is uh, the fact that different assays have differing units, different values, ranges, measurement right. metrics, and all that making them um, incompatible, let's say, between each other. And so that's a challenge for the AI. But I thought this was a interesting story. I'm always very curious to see how AI can transform things like exactly this and you know from a super kind of a supercharged perspective of what we could do before and then taking the power of AI and you know its analytical capabilities and and applying it to something really important. Yeah, this is where where it really does matter. I mean I was reading up on on AI being able to predict where tumors appeared earlier than the human eye could catch them. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And then here on, on, on pharma, I, I once gave a, an address to a, a pharma company in, in Switzerland. Very nice trip. It was good, good chocolate. Um, and sure. the language that I never realized about pharma is what they talked about is what they trade in is molecules. They're always in the hunt for a molecule and then the use of it. And, um, that makes it a little simpler to get your head around that there's a, a finite set of, uh, well, I guess not quite finite, but there's a known set of molecules that could be used, created or used. There's a test that exists against it. And one thing about the pharma industry is that they go through, obviously, a tremendous amount of failure. They try a hypothesis. It doesn't work. They do something else. And one of the problems for the industry has been that they didn't share their failures because it would seem like, well, let the other guy go through the same stuff we went through. Mm -hmm. When it gets mm -hmm. to AI and training sets, I hope that it motivates pharma to share that data more openly uh, so that these systems can be smarter and that everybody's going to be better off as a result. Uh, and I'll be yeah. curious just kind of ethically where that goes uh, in that industry. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. I'm very curious to see how that how that uh, proliferates and influences uh, development of those, those things. Um, and then finally... Robotics, which is, you know, kind of AI, um, right? Robotics and AI really seem to travel in the same kind of direction. And and I think in the future, this is going to mm -hmm. you know become mm -hmm. more and more the case. But Mark Gurman at Bloomberg wrote about Apple's exploration of robotics as its next pursuit, quote, beyond the iPhone. And uh, so, you know, which which brings back memories of, of the the auto, their self-driving car 
initiative that basically you know went away according to sources here it's looking into ways to bring robots uh into the home and mark german points out that you know essentially the car the driving car project was you know a giant rolling robot um at its core and so you know some internally are saying that by shuttering that de that department they're able to redirect more staff at being positioned towards this goal with a much higher focus. But, you know, it's still going to be a long time before we see um, any of this stuff happening. They have a tabletop device codenamed J595 that has an iPad type display, cameras and a base with a robotic actuator um, as a product that German says should arrive in 2026 or 2027, but who the heck knows? I mean, it's hard. Rob Collins asked shuffle. In, 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 the, in the comments, you know, what kind of robot would, I, would Apple actually make? And I, when I hear this notion of a tabletop robot, I can't envision what that does. Uh, mm -hmm. Shuffle some cards for me? I mean, I, 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 probably my paucity of imagination to figure out what that might be. Uh, yeah. But um, that's the latest description. We'll just have to see. It's it's a it's yeah. a it's a solution looking for a problem, and maybe they'll find it. Yeah, maybe maybe. Um, and then let's see here. As as far as things that the robot could actually do, uh, according to the article, um, <laughs> it could be a device that comes to you when you're preoccupied and you need to do something <laughs> with a device or whatever. So okay, uh, that's that's kind of hard to. Hard to figure out. Uh, operator, check on something in the house while you're gone. Do household chores. That would be a good one. Would love to see a robot do some household chores. That would I just don't see Apple being in the vacuuming business, though. You know, <laughs> totally. It's not, yeah, it's, it's not a little part of their strange. ethos. Yeah, Polishing, um, maybe, but not vacuuming. And if you thought Apple Vision Pro was expensive right out of the gate, just imagine how, uh, you know, some... Oh robot that cleans your home how pricey that's going to be um and then finally real quick and then we're going to take a break i just i came across this video from disney uh research it's an old video it's actually from 2020 but the whole approach of this is a robotic that is meant to imitate the facial movements of a human in the eyes and then also kind of like these subtle head nods and things like that so um, you could have that on your yeah. desktop, freaking you yes. out. Yes, you know, put a skin bag over it, and it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> Anyways, interesting to look at, nonetheless. All right, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we should have a fun conversation uh, coming right up. All right, Jeff. Uh, today is is a day of of, of winging it because we had some plans for this episode. Uh, plans change sometimes uh, on you at a moment. Technology, notice. and so yeah, sometimes you know, technology. Even it's not just AI that's imperfect. It's it's all types of technology. So we've got a bunch of stories here. You are more familiar with some of these stories than I am. So we're going to kind of like reverse the roles a little bit and you get to set up some of this stuff and uh, let me know. And then I can, you know, kind of jump in and let you know what I think about it while we're talking about it. Sure. So, what do you so, yeah, the way, the way this works is I go through all week and I find AI stories and I put them in this rundown also in, in the twig rundown. And then yeah. I put them in here and Jason has very good news judgment, really does, understands what um, is going to make for a good show and a good discussion. And he puts stuff up and we thought we were going to have a guest. So we did fewer stories. So we just went back in and found some more. So we'll go through a couple of these. One is the Washington Post. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I like to, because I'm very critical these days of the New York Times and the Washington Post yeah. on both politics and technology. So when I find something good and positive, <clears throat> I want to point it out. So Yan mm -hmm. Wu at the Washington Post wrote a story about how why musicians are smart to embrace AI and see it. I figured with you, Dr. Musician, sure. uh, it might be interesting to see how they present this. Uh, but it's really about being able to use it for inspiration and yes. um, uh, getting past, you know, as a writer, I can understand this to an extent, but it's pretty hard for me to use it because I have specific things I need to say and mm. it doesn't really get me over. But I'm curious for you, Jason, if you're trying to get past a melody or past lyrics or past an idea, do you think this, in terms of your own creativity, would be mm -hmm. helpful, is helpful. Yeah, I mean, and I've done videos to exactly this point um, on the Tech Splitter YouTube channel. Um, I am 
endlessly fascinated about the progress, the progression of artificial intelligence and music generation, not from the perspective that a lot of people seem to be, which is, oh, I can type in a prompt and it creates an entire song for me and blah, blah, blah. Like I'm, I'm less interested in that, but although I respect, you know, that people do get interested in that as a musician, this is exactly what excites me about AI. I see it as a tool for kind of giving me a little bit of an extra kind of um, pathway to go down in understanding like different options or different ideas or different, you know, melodies that might open up or unlock a certain direction in my mind when I'm working on a song. And I've, especially when I've written myself into a corner, which I'm sure has, you know, a direct analog to writing and authorship is, you know, at a certain point, it's like, it's like my creativity has spent and it's taken me to a certain point. And it's like, I love the idea and I love how I got here, but I have no clue what to do from here. And sometimes I hit those points as a musician. Mm -hmm. If I was working with an actual musician in a studio mm -hmm. environment, that would be where that collaborative kind of uh, conversation happens where that person that I'm sitting next to says, Oh, well, you know what just came to me? It's, you know, why don't we go in there and we tweak the bass and make it blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, Oh wow. Suddenly I'm alive again. Right. Which was like what a producer does. Supercharges. Right. Right. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So that is that role of giving you a thought or trying something you hadn't thought of. If you go down the yes. story, uh, I didn't listen to it all. Uh, but if you turn up the volume on the Washington post story on the, on the upper right side and scroll down yeah. to the guy with the bass, Got it. So here's um, bassist Mike Foley performs a solo. Lion wanted to create an unambiguous 100% human moment. So that's this. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. This is an actual human bassist right now. Yes. And now. So now we scroll up. Okay. To the next screen. Then to build the music's poetic character, Lion added AI narration of a dream about a labyrinth. A labyrinth of stairs. Described by philosopher Walter Benjamin. Okay. This is AI now. I climbed. So the AI. So is it the narration that's AI, AI. or is the accompaniment yes. AI? The, AI. the accompaniment. On a landing, I realized that I had arrived at a summit. Okay. A wide view. And so he's land. playing also with also, AI exactly. musicians. Then or, yeah. That's a weird switch. <laughs> it is, it is. So then yeah. added musical layers and drum uh, patterns for the song. So I don't know if I like the result very much. But it also makes the sole creator able to do a lot. Able to experiment. Totally. Well, and that's what, what gets me excited because I, as a musician... You know, I've been writing music and, and working with, you know, friends of mine writing music for almost 30 years now. And since, you know, when I lived in my hometown, Boise, Idaho, I was surrounded by people that I knew who were all learning this stuff along with me. And so we collaborated a lot and it was really an inspirational time. Since I've been, you know, started a family and everything, I don't really know many people who do music. And so it's been largely a kind of a solo operation. And I miss the collaborative thing. Right, right. Because mm -hmm. it's a lot of pressure for, for me to, to like come up with everything. Like I can do it, but sometimes like it's just not fun to have to do that. Like I want to bounce ideas off of someone. So that's where this technology really does. And it's not really to me. judgmental the way a producer is, but it's inspirational the way a producer can be. Um, yeah. You know, it doesn't say, oh, that's crappy, Jason. You shouldn't do that. You know, you're not going <laughs> right, yeah, totally. to right? <laughs> yeah, it's always going to yes. please you. Always, always going to be your friend. But it can, yeah. it can give you ideas you didn't otherwise have. So I think I mentioned this on last week's show. Uh, we're talk about this a lot more as we go forward. I just wrote a syllabus uh, for a course at another university I'm planning to be working with. I can't announce yet. And because mm -hmm. actually, by today is the day I am officially retired from CUNY and officially emeritus. Like today is today. The, today the, is the day? day. Yes. My, wow. my congratulations. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, so I'll well, be well, working with another university soon, I hope. And it's all about AI and creativity. And my idea in the course is to get students to, to get something they want to express. And then I, I want them to express it on their own, just like this, just like the basis. Mm -hmm. A purely human moment. And I don't care if you hate it, I don't care if it's bad, I don't care anything. Just mm -hmm. see what you can do on your own and then to experiment with what AI can add or not. Mm -hmm. How is it a helpmate? How isn't it? What kinds of tools? Is it inspiring? Does it help finish things? That's what I want the students to explore and see what the relationship is in collaboration with AI. And I know we're mm -hmm. going to have Lev Manovich on pretty soon. 
And yes. Lev is a brilliant um, uh, scholar at uh, City University of New York Graduate Center in um, digital humanities. But he's been doing a lot around this about trying to understand how AI becomes a creative tool, no different from a base or a baton or a paintbrush, yep. mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. different. So anyway, I thought you'd find this one interesting and and just uh, the I, I th- that's exactly it. I mean, when I opened the article and saw the, you know, the basically the subheaded, <laughs> which said today's experimenters are finding it can be more an inspiration than a threat. I was like, yeah, that's that's exactly that's how I yeah. feel about these tools, because so many of the videos that I've done about this the comment section ends up being uh, either people who totally get it or, or totally agree with kind of my hypothesis around how musicians use these tools or the flip side, which is, you know, the, the doom, the, the doom and gloom AI is killing creativity. Right, AI right, right. is killing, you know, it's the end of blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, it doesn't, it, it's not though. <laughs> I mean, it might be a change. It might be a fork in the road from where we were to where we are going, but, like that's just technology. That's yeah. t- that's technology uh, in a nutshell. We we learn and we adapt and we use it in the new ways that we have op- exactly. the options to now. I mentioned my friend so. Matthew Christianbaum earlier from University of Maryland. He was part of a task force at the Modern Language Association, the MLA, which is the educators in that field, and they mm-hmm. did a really good report on using AI uh, in English in the classroom. And they said the printing press is a tool, the typewriter is a tool. It's a tool, and and it's and tool. to ignore it would be wrong. To learn mm-hmm. how to use it well is the right way to go. Yeah, yeah. So the next story is yes. uh, and recently I, I found this from uh, Benedict and uh, uh, Benedict Evans, who is an analyst. I think the world of uh, he's great. Res- subscribe to his newsletter, and he used to work at Andreessen Horowitz. So he put up a list of the top 100 generative AI consumer apps. What I found out interesting about this is how few I've ever heard of, and that's maybe shameful given what we do right here. I should know more of them. But, they, well, my but point there's is, so many. It's, and it's they haven't broken through. Them. They haven't really broken yeah. out. So if you go yeah. down, there's a fair number we would know here. ChatGPT, obviously. Character.ai, which has kind of gotten Suno, half acquired. Udio, Perplexity, we Claude. Um, face. Uh, labs. Right. Uh, but yeah. then a, a Viggle. Um, but it falls apart pretty quickly. So let me just read some and see whether you've heard of any of these before. Oh, Ideogram. I love Ideogram, actually. Yeah. That's great. Um, janitor yeah. AI, no Quillbot, no Poe. I think I might have heard of Liner. Oh yeah, for sure Poe. Yeah, we did. Okay, yeah. Liner, Liner no. Civitai, uh, Civit uh, yeah, AI, whatever. Civit it is. AI. Yep, heard of. Yep. Um, Spicy Chat. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> no. <laughs> Eleven Labs, Luma. Yeah, we've it's... heard of Candy. AI. I don't think I've heard of Crush on mm-hmm. AI, Leonardo. AI, Mid Madrid. Yeah. Yes, Yad. Yo, 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 yeah, I don't know what that is. Uh, cutout, dot pro, uh, photo room, gamma, video, enough. Um, yeah, the point is that there's just tons of these things people are putting money into. So many. I saw a separate story today that I, uh, I think three quarters of all of the startups in, um, uh, what's the big, the big, um, uh, uh, the huge, uh, 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 um, uh, incubator. Um, the one that everybody goes to, you know what I mean? But are you are AI or AI oriented? Um, and the one Sam Altman used to run. Uh, right. So then there's top yeah. 50 Gen IA mobile apps by monthly active users. Uh, Microsoft Edge comes up to number two. Uh, Photo Math, Bing is up higher because it's tied to your phones. Uh, Brainly, which I don't think was on the other list. But same thing happens. It falls off yeah. really quickly. There's more brands here. Adobe Express, um, things you're going to, Microsoft Swift Key, which I've never heard of. You're going to come to those oh, yeah, because you're using key, other yeah. things. Um, Swift Key has been around for a long time. Uh, Snap Edit. Uh, but those are all things that come attached to another app that you do use, but mm-hmm. not as brands on their own. So Got branding in this, in this AI world uh, is at this point – really a challenge that was that was what interested me about this story oh man I, i'm just looking at this as like a as a as a research point for myself i want to go yeah. in there and find out what a lot of these things actually are the, the ones that i haven't heard of i'm actually surprised at how many of these i i am somewhat familiar with i mean there's a lot on here that i don't know but um but i because but because this is such a hot kind of uh, market. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but uh, you know, a hot 
item right now, just mm-hmm. AI in general and especially generative AI. I mean, I feel like there's new services. If you go on Product Hunt, you know, just to kind of see what what new things are hitting there, it's it's overwhelming. It's truly overwhelming the amount of products that are coming out to be the next yep. AI for this or Ooh. AI for that. So it's you know, even within certain categories, it's really hard to know well, which one's the best within that category. I, I don't even know how many. My, I guess my question is. Of a, of a list of these 50, how many of these are going to be around in two years oh, or I think five very, very years? Few, very few. Um, yeah, like – But that's, that's the odds of bought it. and fold it in or – yeah. I, I thank Rob in the, in the in the comments that it's Y Combinator was where my senior moment was going. Y Combinator. There you go. There yes, you go. Uh, at least I have the excuse. I am a senior now. I'm emeritus, but uh, but you don't, oh. Jason. Uh, I, I I have the horrible affliction of the second someone says, what's the name of the blah, blah, blah? My mind goes completely blank and I'm like – I, you know, you could be asking me, what's what's your mom's name, blah, blah, blah. And if it's said it the right way, I would suddenly be like, oh, my goodness, why can I not think of it? I know. So, by the way, Rob says yeah, also in the comments, I'm curious just another time to hear. He says he talked to his PhD advisor and she decided to do something similar. She's a historian. So I'm curious to hear what your PhD is going toward, Rob, but we'll do that another time. Yeah. So <laughs> on with the next story. Interesting. Um, yes. Uh, so Andrew Jassy from, um, uh, Amazon and obviously mm-hmm. AWS said that the average time he, he posted this on LinkedIn, which I just found fascinating out of nowhere. Um, the average time used to upgrade, um, an application to Java 17 plummeted from typically 50 developer days to a few hours using generative wow. AI. Uh, we estimate wow. this has saved us 4,500 developer developer years of work. Yes, that's crazy, but real. In under six, that's isn't that's, it crazy? That's pretty remarkable. And what he points out is this kind of up, up upgrading is things that people, developers hate to do because you're going mm-hmm. back into what you've done before and it's not fun. You're not building anything. He said, in under six months, we've been able to uh, upgrade more than 50 percent of our production Java systems to modernize Java versions at a fraction of the usual time and effort. And our developers shipped 79% of the auto-generated code reviews without any additional changes. That's what I was wondering. I was like, all right, so it's able to do all this stuff. How much time do you then spend you know, uh, verifying and, and correcting? And right. that's a high number of, of, of you know, the, the code that was generated that was fine, ultimately right. fine, 80, almost 80%. So Jassy says that there's an estimated $260 million in annualized efficiency gains, otherwise known as savings. And so what really strikes me about this, these, these two stories wow. together is that is, is AI and generative AI a consumer, a B2C tool, or a B2B uh, enterprise tool? Mm. I, I think we're going to find the value in the savings clearly in the enterprise and not in For the sense sure. of, you know, uh, Sally executive at her desk using it to write more PowerPoints. Fine. Mm-hmm. I don't mean that. But I mean these kinds of, uh, of, of specific tasks – that can be improved and measured and, and tested against to see whether they're right because it matters. Uh, that's mm-hmm. going to be where the, where the value comes, I think. So that and medicine, yeah. those other things we've talked about. So just yeah, another sure. interesting tidbit here. 50 developer days to just a few hours. Like that's, that's just, that's, that's awesome. Really, that's, yeah, that's, that's remarkable. And I'm sure there are a number of different examples of how, this time savings is, you know, is time and time again with uh, generative AI and, and and everything. I mean, I I know for the stuff that I'm doing as a solo, you know, independent content creator, there are certain tasks that I do regularly that I employ, you know, my AI, be it perplexity or whatever, to help me do. That if I was that if I wasn't using AI to do that, I'd still be doing those tasks, and it would definitely be taking me hours instead of yes, fifteen minutes. And that's, uh, that's, you know, that all compounds on top of itself when you, you know, as you do this more and as more people rely on these systems and everything, it's just, it really is, it really is a huge time saver. And um, yeah, that's, that's pretty fascinating. Yep. Love it. So, however, people never really learn the lesson of what AI can't do well. It can't do facts. It can't do meaning. It's not good at search. Uh, but the producers and the the marketing company for for uh, Francis Ford Coppola's next movie, Megalopolis, um, which is, I guess, already getting or bound to get bad reviews, they decided quite cleverly because we know that Coppola is a genius. He made 
Godfather for 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 his sakes. He's yeah. he's amazing, he had right? A lot of really great films. So they decided yeah. to make a trailer which would go back and show all of the bad reviews that his prior works, his masterpieces got, so that you're kind of primed for the bad reviews that Megalopolis is going to get. The problem is that they used AI to do that, so all the bad reviews were not real. And it took a while for somebody to catch this, um, but uh, let's see here. The um, uh, Pauline Kael, who was you know the goddess of film reviewers, uh, completely adored Godfather and Godfather 2. She lavished praises on the reading for The Vulture right now um, and said of the whole epic, this is a bicentennial picture that doesn't insult the intelligence. It's an epic vision of corruption in America. However, the alleged quote attributed to her in the trailer said that Godfather is, quote, diminished by its artsiness. <laughs> that was nowhere in a review. Uh, and so similarly, I guess every That's single why. one of these was completely wrong. Uh, Andrew Saris was said to have called The Godfather uh, a sloppy, self-indulgent movie. That wasn't in his review. Rex Reed did, in fact, pretty much hate Apocalypse Now, but his quote doesn't appear in the review either. Roger Ebert's mostly positive review of Bram Stoker's Dracula, so it wasn't just um, Coppola's Bad. movies, um, uh, yeah. uh, does okay. not include the words, a triumph of style over substance. And instead, he said, the movie is an exercise uh, in feverish excess. And for that, if little else, I enjoyed it. Right. So it's one of those funny stories we now have, like the lawyer whose case I covered, where some idiot schmuck decides to use AI for this purpose, doesn't check what's going on. And Got AI doesn't understand facts. It's going to yeah. always give you an answer, people. And it doesn't care if the answer is wrong. Right. I'm reminded of a, uh, an assistant city. When I work on the Chicago Tribune after Chicago Today folded, paper that had no tomorrow. I caught the lifeboat to the Chicago Tribune midnight shift. And in Chicago, the bars are open late. And people would get into bar fights about facts. And the library is closed, so they can't call the librarian. So they call the city desk of the newspaper. Got these calls all the time. And mm. Billy Garrett, who was the assistant city editor of midnight shift, uh, said he had a rule. He said, always give them an answer, preferably the wrong one. Because he always laughed the next morning thinking that there was a knockdown drag out fight before they could get the actual facts. This is before the internet. So folks, <laughs> look up stuff on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or or if you are going to use AI for any part of this, you got to verify. You got to check yeah. that the, the output is actually accurate. And if you're not, like that's just pure laziness. Think... Think of the amount of time it would have taken you to do all of that by hand. Right. And instead you got AI to do it. And when the AI is done doing it, supposedly, like if you don't stop there, it's easy to then be at that point and then be like, Ugh, now I got to go and check him. No, it's fine. It'll be fine. But just think of all the time you would have spent if you oh. hadn't done this. To well, it's worse with. off. So spend a little bit longer to verify and you'll be okay. Yeah. The hapless uh, <laughs> marketing consultant who did this trailer is pictured in deadline and uh, the studio has now cut ties with him. So oh, this man, is a they, very costly mistake for him. Yeah. No kidding. No kidding. Very hmm, interesting. Yep. <laughs> and unsurprising as well. Yep. And so finally, finally uh, go ahead. You go. Well, yeah, no, this is just uh, about perplexity, which is, Yes, I, I, I mention it a lot, but primarily because it's just the AI um, platform that I use uh, most often, and so I'm most familiar with it and everything. But we've talked in, uh, in shows past that Perplexity was planning on on a running AI, or sorry, running ads on uh, some of the experience in the future, and it looks like they're about to start selling those ads. Uh, these these ads will appear next to their AI assisted search results, so you could uh, end up seeing this. I'm I'm not entirely sure exactly when, sometime in the fourth quarter, but um, it's coming around the bend, and uh, you know, if you're if you're gonna use perplexity, I what I wonder is if you're paying for it, do you still see the ads? It's a good question, and I'm not entirely certain on that, but yeah, you know, hopefully not. Because I, I use Discover or Perplexity, um, mm -hmm. and it doesn't it does I don't know less than half a dozen stories a day, so it's not like it's a it's a substitute news source at all. But the, the, they they do a good job of packaging it. They link to the sources. Um, mm -hmm. 
And uh, so I can see there being ads in there, you know, because I'm using it as a free service right now. It's fine. Yeah, discover. Is it discover.ai? Is that what you're talking no, about? No, if you go to Perplexity, the app, and then oh, click oh, on Discover. Oh, I see. I see. That's its so news then, stories. Okay. And how? what have you yeah, thought about? I think it's pretty good. So if you go to, yeah. uh, let's see here. What's an example? Um, the let's see here. The uh, SpaceX that. Polaris launch delayed. So they have a human being curated by Twombly, who's somebody who works with them, but they have links to astronomy, business standard, France 24, Wikipedia, um, space, you know, half dozen mm-hmm. sources. And then below more sources with the headlines. So I think it's a very responsible way to present it. Unlike much mm-hmm. else, um, I can check it against uh, those sources. It gives credit to those sources. So I think it's pretty good. Even though publishers are screaming about them, I think this is a model for how it might be done. Now, mm-hmm. once they add ads to this, the publishers are going to go streaming saying, well, you owe us a piece of that. But once mm-hmm. again, that's a good point. The publishers do this. They're linking to the publishers. They're sending the publishers traffic and the publishers are doing the same thing to each other. Uh, mm-hmm. Because the fact that one thing that comes across when you use perplexity discover is how much repetition there is in news mm-hmm. because the same yeah. story can have a half dozen links that are essentially basically the exact same. Yeah. So who yeah. copied from whom, who, who's owed the dollar there? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, well, good. You're, you're getting in on the perplexity thing. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm super curious to hear how, how you've, thought about that after your experience after hearing me <laughs> talk about it so much on the show well we did it jeff we made it uh, by the skin of our teeth to the <laughs> yes. end of this episode uh turning on a dime it, with an unexpected circumstance uh and you know what if we hadn't called it out a couple of times people probably wouldn't have even known the difference so that's a good thing um so that guest awesome, we were going to talk to today we didn't talk to because you wonder where they went we'll be a future we will. show we will. Yeah, that'll be a future show. It's coming. And then you did also mention earlier Lev Manovich um, as a future guest. Mm-hmm. We've got Lev scheduled for an episode in September. And I tell you what, I'm really, I know you are, I'm really looking forward to that conversation as well. It's going to be all about, you know, kind of AI and creativity, music, art, the whole nine yards. So uh, s- some great guests coming yeah. up on this show. But uh, Jeff, uh, GutenbergParenthesis.com. Yes. Anything, uh, nope. That's it for now. So, now. Soon enough, my son will do, give me a, a new page around jeffjarvis.com and I'll have links and discount codes for all three of my books there, but that'll be soon. Yes, indeed. Excellent. What is, where is, what would Google, was it, what would Google do? Was, uh, mm-hmm. one of your, that was why the first is that book. not on here anymore? Uh, it's, it's old. <laughs> it's old. <laughs> it's old. <laughs> You've written enough books now that you can take your old work. And be that's like, right. Yeah, it's, it's gotten, you go point. away. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I highly respect that. Uh, Gutenberg parenthesis.com is the place to go to check that, uh, check out all of Jeff's uh, writings and work. Um, for me, you can go to uh, youtube.com slash at Texploder. When you go there, you can subscribe to the show or subscribe to the channel and you'll get alerted when we do live streams like today. Um, when the video version of AI Inside is published, that will appear there. And then um, if you go to AIinside.show, that is actually where the podcast uh, pretty much all the information about the podcast is listed on AI Inside dot show. We do include the video links. So, you know, last week's episode, you can get there and you can listen to it or subscribe, but then you also do have the ability to watch the video version if that's your preference. So if you got to go to one place, I'd say AI Inside dot show is your one place on the web to check out. You can also get to our Patreon from there, Patreon dot com slash AI inside show there you can support us and uh, be sure you know that we're we continue to do the show each and every week we'd really do rely on your support to continue things uh, as we have done and you get things you know in in a kind of a trade for that you get ad free episodes you get early access to videos discord community regular hangouts you uh, also get an AI Inside t-shirt if you become an executive producer like our current executive producers, Dr. Do, Jeffrey Maraccini, WPVM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina, and Paul Lang. They, whether they're wearing their shirt today or not, they're getting one if they haven't already. And you could too. Just become an executive producer and you'll get one. It's a great quality shirt, I got to say. I wear mine all the time. 
Uh, but of course, it's it's my show, so you know. Um, but everything uh, everything else is gravy. Thank you so much for being here with us each and every week. We can't thank you enough for that, and uh, thank you, Jeff, for the hangouts. And always, we'll see we'll see y'all next week on another episode of AI Inside. Bye, everybody. Bye.